Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? Amongst the news items we have for you this week is a 20th anniversary of sorts. Admittedly a depressing anniversary as it's the death of Dr. Carlo Urbani who helped isolate and identify the SARS outbreak in the early 2000s. A new deadly superfungus can be found in more than half of the states in America. An apple a day can at least somewhat keep the doctor away, if you're using genetically modified apples that is. Vox has an interesting article on how the Dutch are actually one of the powerhouses when it comes to seed production. Research has somewhat controversially argued that the purportedly extinct Tasmanian tiger may have survived into the 1980s or later again, where it was thought to have died out at the start of the 20th century. And we have legal news on Obamacare and how the mandate requiring coverage may well have just been changed again. The timestamps for these and other news items can be found in the description box below. Let's start with the 20th anniversary of the death of Dr. Carlo Urbani and how the World Health Organization is commemorating it, let's say. The good doctor died as part of the effort to isolate and deal with SARS as it started spreading in 2003. SARS is a much earlier variant of the coronavirus family that caused similar issues to what we're facing with COVID-19. Thankfully, it had a much higher fatality rate and burnt itself out, before spreading as much as COVID-19 has. But, in the process of doing so, there was a very high fatality rate. In 2003, he was working in Vietnam to try and coordinate and facilitate the appropriate measures to curtail the spread of SARS. Unfortunately, he was infected in the process of doing so. The particularly sad part of all of this is that only a few months later, SARS was contained and eventually burnt out. This is why his legacy, let's say, is being commemorated. Admittedly, a legacy that we would like to have seen in other diseases which are now seeing a comeback. Notably, polio. What should come as no surprise to anyone is that New York is the epicenter of this newest wave of polio. The other unsurprising element to this is that it's Rockland County where last year they observed a similar degree of outbreak. But not only were they observing the outbreak itself, but that there continued to be positive results in wastewater. This meant that there was a much larger circulation of polio than the sheer case count alone would indicate. The reason we refer to this as an unfortunate situation is that polio has two things that should have made it a non-issue. One, there is a easily accessible and very effective vaccine. Two, the symptoms of polio infection are significant and being infected can lead to things like being paralyzed. As such, there is a good reason to be vaccinated. Rockland County, among others in New York, some parts of New York State have uh, counties with as low as 60% vaccination rates for polio. This leaves 40% completely unprotected and is well below any kind of herd immunity threshold. This means that it has the ability to constantly circulate, reinfect and, well, never go away, leading to more individuals getting infected and being subject to all the complications of polio. Of course, this is not the only disease that America needs to worry about at the moment. Another is the particular variant of Candida auris that is working its way throughout more than half of the states in America. Candida auris is being considered a superbug. But what differentiates it from the other superbugs, as they're colloquially called, is that this is fungal, not bacterial, and that's a slight concern. As a general rule, there are fewer antifungals, and in a broader sense, there is less interest in investigating them. This means as Candida auris gets resistance to more and more antifungals, there are fewer and fewer options available and we are running out of those options relatively quickly. This is a kind of yeast infection, similar to what you'll get with say thrush, 
the difference is primarily that unlike other kinds of yeast that you might want for baking, this is a purely pathogenic kind. And unlike something like the candida involved in thrush, this doesn't ever really show up inside the human body and almost seems to exclusively predate on the human skin. This means that it's much easier to transmit as it's always on the outside of an individual and doesn't need to be communicated through any bodily fluids by necessity. In fact, it can contaminate surfaces and remain there for a number of weeks, therefore infecting other individuals unless either hands are washed or the surfaces are cleaned thoroughly. There are some questionable mortality statistics, and they basically premise that there's between a 30 and 60% fatality rate for those who are infected. Understand, infected not necessarily have a candida issue. The distinction, however, and the reason why it's somewhat questionable statistics, is that most individuals who die have a number of other comorbidities or issues which are either contributing to the mortality, which is unsurprising, or they make them more vulnerable to infection in the first place, which means that even if they do get infected, it's going to be a more significant infection and therefore higher likelihood of mortality. That's enough death, doom, and gloom for now. Let's focus on something that might at least be remotely positive. That is, crosswords and similar sort of word puzzles may help you hold off or deter cognitive decline as you get older. This includes your more basic crossword puzzles, like for example what you'd find in the Sunday newspaper, or puzzle games like Wordle. The study in question specifically looks at whether or not this sort of activity will help with dementia and Alzheimer's. Both are neurogenic diseases and are typified by the cognitive decline an individual has, along with a range of other issues that aren't obvious unless you actually start conducting scans. The study itself does come with a range of caveats, and on top of what's mentioned in the article we'll link you to, we have some other concerns, notably the uh, very small study size, the uh, lack of longevity to the study, and that it's unknown whether or not there are other possibilities. They compare it to Lumosity, which is a cognitive training game type platform or app against crosswords, but for example, video games might have the same effect. There's also no control group to speak of. It really was just a comparison study for older individuals, and a small number at that, over a very short period of time, 12 weeks, with a relatively short period of training each day, about 30 minutes, and depending on the degree to which you enjoy crosswords or the difficulty of the crossword, 30 minutes may or may not be enough. This means the results are interesting, but we really have no idea if it's a dose-dependent relationship or if it is purely just something happenstance. The blog post we link you to, of course, has other issues that the writer of the article has identified themselves. Moving from uh, cognitive decline to an expert's opinion on why you should not sit with your legs crossed, which is yet another case for why manspreading is an anatomical necessity. Other than the uh, anatomical necessity for males in uh, not having their legs squished together, thereby crushing their testicles, the other effects are less obvious and likely less immediately painful and they're also applicable to both males and females. The first is simply that whether you sit with your legs crossed at the ankles or the knees, you're going to find something of the same effect. Admittedly different levels, but the same effect. The big one is going to be the change in blood pressure and movement of blood in your body. To an extent, by crossing ankles or knees, you have blood pulling in the veins and your heart needs to work harder to push against this blood that's pulling and waiting. This means increases in blood pressure to get it back to the heart and keep blood flowing the way it should be. You're probably thinking, okay, but that's not a major problem, and chances are that you're right. The second consideration is somewhat more significant. That is the uh, change in how your body aligns, and most notably in the hips. 
as a general rule, your hips should sit relatively parallel and level. This is one reason why the body's the way it is. You have a degree of symmetry. When you cross your legs, and notably at the knees rather than the ankles, you get one hip to sit higher than the other. This leads to changes in how the muscles are working and how the skeleton is lined up. This can lead to a longer term misalignment of the hips and consequently misalignment of the spine and this can work its way up to the shoulders. Rather than travelling up the body, it will travel down to the joints in the knees, the feet and the hips themselves. Again, looking at issues with misalignment, and particularly the ball and socket joint of the hip itself, which can be pulled on and gradually wear away. Admittedly by itself, this is unlikely to be the sole contributing factor to issues with the hip joint, but it is a consideration. There's also effects on the muscles in that area, along with further down towards your knee, where you have, by virtue of having one knee over the other, put one of your knees at a slight angle thereby twisting it, and this can add up over years to a rather significant amount of pressure. This also extends all the way down to the ankle. This is all to be taken in consideration of uh, two things. One, we are explicitly talking about what could be called sedentary sitting. That is, when you're on a seat or similar, and not actively doing anything. The second is that there are other other scenarios, such as yoga, where although you may be crossing your lower limbs, that may not be having the same effect due to other things that come into play when you're doing that. Further health-related news looks at how consuming an apple a day, particularly if it's polyphenol-enriched apples, could help with your health. The interesting article comes from New Zealand and research conducted there. What they were looking at was the health benefit of red fleshed apples. These are apples that have a much higher content of the polyphenols. They were comparing them to the white fleshed or more typical apple that you would encounter. The short version of that result is that they appear to have found a significant reduction in some of the more common cancer risks and the improvement in immunological pathways associated with that. The research itself isn't necessarily focusing on the apple itself. The polyphenols are what are significant, but it's what they then do inside the body, and focusing explicitly on the intestines and the microbial populations therein. It appears that the uh, polyphenol-rich apple has an effect on the population of microbes that are in the GI tract and these in turn have the effects on cancer risk and things like immunological pathways and risk factors associated with what they're going to be doing. The study also found that the results of this had an effect on various genes as they were expressed. About 18 genes in total, only 16 of which were then related to immunoglobulins or antibodies that were associated with activity of the immune system. All of this sounds great, except for one rather large caveat to it all. The study was very small in size. It involved 25 individuals. So, it's interesting, but the ability to actually draw anything of significance out of it is not really that great. Unfortunately, however, the methodology, the results as they're written, and everything else produces a relatively robust study that is worth looking into and hopefully conducting the research on a, a larger scale. Going to agricultural news, but still health related. The interesting relationship between using calcium rich materials to reduce arsenic uptake in soil or from the soil. Depending on where you live in the world, but especially if you live in areas that historically have been uh, very active for mining of minerals, you may find that there is a surprisingly high arsenic content in the soil, particularly if you get down far enough. If you do find that, it's worth 
taking action to either remediate the soil or at least remove as much of it as you can if you're home gardening. For agricultural purposes, that may not be feasible from a purely financial perspective, given the sheer amount of land that would need to be cleared and then refilled with new soil. This is why calcium could be useful as a, a way of preventing the plants from taking up much of that. The research used a uh, calcium material called calcite phosphogypsum. This is useful in that it locks the arsenic in the soil and prevents it from being removed. And researchers from Korea were looking at just how effective it is in doing that. Their results are promising, more so when you consider that both the calcium and gypsum are either readily available products or byproducts of other industrial applications related to agriculture. This means that, at least in practice, it should be relatively readily available and relatively cheap. Next we go on to an interesting article coming from the most surprising of places, Vox. And the gist of it is that the Dutch actually have one of the most let's say, advanced or perhaps well-developed seed technology industries in the world. The area that they are going to talk about, particularly in the article, is otherwise known as the Seed Valley, although, as the article does note, the Netherlands is notoriously flat and there's no actual valley to speak of. It's simply a reference to the fact that it is a industrial technological centre that is something of a powerhouse, similar to Silicon Valley in America. This area has a, a very large role to play in what could be best described as basically developing future-proofed plants, for example, fungal-resistant bean species. And there are more varieties again that they're trying to develop and get growing so that they can develop on a large scale. In further food and technology related news, but somewhat more weird, it's that an Australian startup is looking to grow mammoth meat and use it as a food source. Why they want to create a meatball using mammoth meat is odd, but perhaps it's purely marketing. The whole approach required a bit of creativity as they didn't have a complete gene for the myoglobin, which is what they were making the meat from primarily. This meant that they had to take lessons from Jurassic Park and find a related enough species to be able to take parts of that gene and use that as a template from which to fill in the gaps. The reason we look at this as a purely marketing based stunt is that the meat isn't actually available to consume. The reason for that is that it has yet to go under the appropriate safety and policy testing to ensure its safe consumption. However, it is a, a massive leg up in the uh, marketing department. Further to weird animal news, and a species that was thought to go, have gone extinct in the very early part of the 20th century, somewhere as late as 1936, we have the uh, Tasmanian tiger. A somewhat controversial study has argued that, in fact, it wasn't in 1936, but possibly well into 1986 that the Tasmanian tiger, a uh, weird species rather unique to Australia, and even within Australia, unique to Tasmania, went extinct. The uh, downside to this research is that it is almost entirely dependent on about 1,200 sighting reports. These are not just random sighting reports, but reports that were considered to be valid enough to be included in the study. That is, that they are individuals, or at least reports from individuals, who were considered enough of either an expert or trustworthy enough in what they had reported to be included. And this is where it's interesting. While it seems unlikely that the Tasmanian tiger would have survived that far, let alone the extreme end which is in the early 2000s, it is an interesting possibility. More so when you consider that it was a carnivorous marsupial. So think of a meat-eating kangaroo if you will. Further weird animal news has the uh, giant pouch rat from Africa, and how it regulates its reproduction. It seals up its vagina, which 
rather obviously would make it that much harder to be able to reproduce. The investigation into this stems from the fact that these rather large rodents are very useful in a range of ways, whether it's finding landmines, rescuing people, finding tuberculosis and more. Obviously this means that they're being bred, or at least attempting to be bred. This is where the discovery, for lack of a better word, that their vaginas can be sealed off has been found. It explains why they have an odd proclivity for not being as much of an aggressive breeder as other rodent species are. What gets more interesting, other than the fact that they have the ability to control reproduction, is what stimulates the closure of the vagina. And it appears to be whether or not the primary breeding rat within the group is currently alive and sending off signals to close the vagina of others. It seems that when the primary breeder dies, others step in to take over the role. Going from reproductive news to health related news and law, specifically how the law, the legislature and Texas are all interacting. Notably that a federal judge in Texas has decided that Obamacare's mandate that required health insurers cover all of the costs related to screening for cancers and pre-exposure prophylaxis against HIV would not cost patients anything has effectively been overturned. This is not the only time that Obamacare has found itself having trouble with the courts, as the courts seem to find that there are a number of issues the way it's been implemented and run. While the entire premise for the court case is, well, frankly ridiculous, it does however highlight that there is a delineation between what the government can and cannot, let's say, force companies to do. Unfortunately, the judge found for two reasons, one of which was a religious basis for the law to be blocked at present, but the other was having to do with the procedural process by which the Obamacare Act included these particular elements, and the finding that it was an illegally appointed task force that led to it. Next we have a interesting study, let's say, into how just plain old shapes can be really important, especially for maths, and that there are various problems that can be solved simply by looking at shapes. For this, a new shape that's simply been called the hat helps to understand a lot about how you can try and fit everything together. In this case, by using the same shape repeated consistently, you can get a sort of tesseract effect. And tesseract in terms of the repeating shapes can consistently stack on top of each other or next to each other, as opposed to the Marvel invention. Unlike the Marvel invention, theoretically, when all of these are put together, there shouldn't be any repeating design that you can find across it. The final article we have for you this week, although it's not an article, is more based on an experience we had that's more entertaining and interesting than anything else, and it relates to the uh, example of someone unable to grasp the fact that a finite space can only be occupied by so much more finite space. In this case, relating to airline seats. We explained to this individual on Twitter that airline seats are, on average, it's somewhere around 38 centimeters or 16 freedom units. Your average adult male has a hip width of about 30 centimeters or 12 freedom units. This leaves you with roughly 4 inches or 10 centimeters of room on the outside of their body to fit inside the finite space of the seat. Unfortunately, most adult males are not in that range. Most adult males instead have somewhere closer to 5 if not 6 centimeters of leg from the outside of their hip. This means that they cannot physically fit within the confines of a seat without forcing their legs inwards. As we've previously explained, there is a point at which you can bring your legs together and you start causing problems to your testicles in the case of a male. Now a female, due to the differences in anatomy, is less limited by this, which is good for them. For a male, however, 
due to the nature of the hip bone and the way it connects to the femur, and the nature of the human anatomy between the legs cannot fit there. A toddler can understand this when they're using one of those toys where you have specifically shaped holes and specifically shaped pegs to put through the holes. The wrong peg will not go through the wrong hole. It's the square peg round hole paradox, of a kind anyway. The fact that a grown adult can't grasp this fundamental concept that a toddler can understand is honestly rather disappointing. But it appears to be a not necessarily political, but certainly ideological argument, rather than one of logic and reason. That's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.